That's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. That's excited. I forgot my glasses. Amen. <laughs> Did Shannon ever show up? Shannon McDonald? All right. Praise God. She was going to sing if she could make it. And folks, she's a sick lady. And please continue to pray for Shannon. If you have your Bible, turn to Luke 24 with me this morning. If you'd like to stand as we open the book. Luke 24, verse 1. If you want to praise God and shout and glorify God, well, you go right ahead. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Luke chapter 24 and verse 1. The divine text says, Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came to the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had, ha had prepared and certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher. And they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And it came to pass as they were much perplexed thereabout, Behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the ground, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? Father, bless this book now. In thy holy name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. <coughs> Obviously, the 24th chapter of the uh, Gospel of Luke is dealing with with the resurrection because in verse number six it says he's not here he's risen Amen. and my friend this morning I want you to understand something very clearly and that is very simple it is a very simple thing if Christ be not risen then you are still dead in your sins and your loved ones are perished if Christ be not risen then obviously he was an imposter in all of his ministry was in vain. If Christ be not risen, therefore it is a joke that somebody is playing on you. And this feeling that you have in your soul, this joy that rises up inside you this morning, must be some kind of a fascination with something that you can't explain. But the Bible says, Now is Christ risen and become the first fruits of them that slept. So the Lord Jesus Christ is definitely alive. He's alive in a lot of different ways. But my friend, this morning I'm going to call your attention to what it says in verse number 5. It says, Why seek ye the living among the dead? And that's the truth. Why do you seek the living among the dead? For there are many dead things in this world today. The number one dead thing that I can think about is religion. Religion will pull you in and give you all of its, uh, all of its accoutrements and all of its, uh, all of its methods and all of its, its beauty and its glory and everything that applies to religion. But the truth of the matter is it can't do one thing for your soul. Only a resurrected Lord Jesus Christ can do something for your soul. Now you're in this house this morning. I don't know why you're here. Some of you may be here this morning because you're just simply out of curiosity. You want to know, what is this about on Easter that causes Christians to get so worked up? Why is it such a big deal? Some of you may be here today because somebody made you come. You may be here because you had nowhere else to go. You may be here because it's just a habit. But you may be here because you want to come into this house this morning. And you won't exalt the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, let me tell you this morning, my dear friend, if you know him and know him that lives at the right hand of the Father, you, my friend, have something to glory in. And that is the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. He's alive, folks. He lives with everlasting life. It is resurrection life. It is the life that died on the cross. And he said to the Apostle John in Revelation chapter number 1, I am he that liveth and was dead. But he said, John, take a good look at me now. Eyes as 
a flame of fire, hair white as snow, my whole countenance shining as the noonday sun. He said, John, I'm alive forevermore. He said to the disciples in John 11, because I live, ye shall live also. He is the resurrection and the life. The bottom line is that if Christ be not risen from the dead, then you are following a vain religion that has no power in it whatsoever. But make no mistake about it this morning, dear friend. There is power in this house right now. And there is power in the Word of God. There is power in the presence of the Holy Spirit. And you may never in your lifetime genuinely, sincerely tried God. I challenge you this morning to test Him, try Him, call upon His name. Let Him make Himself known to you because He certainly is capable of that. In verse number 11 it says this, when they came back and told the disciples that he had risen from the dead, here's what the scripture says, and their words seemed to them as idle tales, and they believed them not. Did you notice how that unbelief is so natural for us? It's natural for you, and it's natural for me. And if all you know is your vain, fleshly mind, you'll never believe anything higher than yourself. If the only thing you ever know in life is from your own personal experience, what you can put under a microscope, what you can test and try with your intellect, you'll never know the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But if you'll get serious enough today to call upon his name and say, Lord God, if there's a God in heaven, make yourself known to me. I want to know, are you really real? Are you really there? Do you really live? Is there a Lord Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father? If you will pray that prayer in sincerity, he will send the truth to you. The Bible says, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. If you have a desire for the truth, the truth will come to you. Make no mistake about it. You can't hide behind lies. You can't hide behind deception. You can't hide behind so-called human knowledge. If you want to know about this one that we rejoice in today, he will make himself known to you. I challenge you before the sun goes down today to call upon him and say, if there's a God in heaven, make yourself known to me. And he will do that very thing. In the book of Luke chapter number 24 and verse number 16, the Bible says that we have two disciples that were coming out of Jerusalem and headed to Emmaus. And it tells us that the Lord Jesus Christ appeared to them all of a sudden. They didn't know who he was. The Bible said in verse 16, their eyes were holden that they should not know him. And so my friend, he reveals himself to who he chooses to reveal himself to. These were two disciples. Now they were not of the 11. They were not of the inner circle. But there is a group in the peripheral outside the, the immediate group of disciples that were believers in him. They might not have known as much as, say, for example, Peter, James, and John. They might not have been as familiar with all of the miracles that he performed, but they had heard somewhat about the Lord Jesus Christ. And Cleopas was one of them. And he was headed to Emmaus. And the Lord Jesus Christ showed up. He showed up and appeared to them as they walked on the road to Emmaus. But the Bible says they did not know who he was, for he had not revealed himself to them. Now you've heard the name of Jesus. You've sung the songs about Jesus. You've seen the church and you've seen preachers and television and so forth as they show biblical stories. But you still don't know him. You see, you'll never know him if you try to find him. You'll never know him because you don't know where to look for him. You'll never understand him until you get, get real in your heart. Until your heart is willing to receive the truth. Then you'll know who he is. I want you to notice how he quizzes them. I want you to notice the Lord Jesus as he talks to these two on the road to Emmaus. How that he begins to open up their heart and begin to reveal himself to their soul. And then, my friend, the Bible says their heart burned within them. You see, you like to maintain control. Let me just get down there with you and talk to you this morning. You like to be in control. You want to think, well, my mind is smart enough to figure all of this out. I mean, I can weigh this against that, and I can, I can understand this, and I can understand that. But the Bible says it canst thou by searching find out God? No, you won't. He will not let you by searching find him out. He will not appeal to your intellect. God will not, he will not, he will not stroke your ego. He will not make you feel good 
about how smart you are and how great you are. You'll only know him as he reveals himself to you. And he'll only reveal himself to you when you get ready to find out who he is. Now some of you are at that point. Some of you, that point is a long way off for you. And some of you this day don't have a clue what I'm talking about. Your mind is out here somewhere in Never Never Land. But for those of you listening to this preacher this morning, and you are coming to that point where questions are coming up in your life, where you've lost a loved one, you've lost a mother, you've lost a father, you've lost a son, or you've lost a daughter, and the material things piled up in your house, the things that you've accomplished, the stuff that you've done in life is beginning to let you down. You're starting to feel an emptiness and a void inside your soul. You're beginning to realize that there's got to be something greater than making money and that enjoying things and having fun and so forth and so on. You're beginning to understand that there's got to be something greater than that. And I'm going to tell you there is. Would you let him show you in the Bible how? That he revealed himself to them. There's a way in scripture that God would reveal himself to you. But you've got to open your heart. You've got to speak from the heart. And you begin to cry out to God Almighty. And say, Lord, I want to know. I want to know. I want to know. I want to know. God Almighty, would you let me know. And not learn with my head. Speak to me in a way that I've never been spoken to before. Speak to me in a way that I know a human being isn't doing this. Speak to me in a way where I realize there's something much deeper and something much greater that a human could do. And do you think Christianity is just a bunch of emotion? Do you think we're in this house today worshiping God simply because we were raised as Baptists and this is the thing that we do on Easter Sunday morning? Or can you allow in your heart for a minute that people in this house are so full of joy and rejoicing in the one that saved them, that washed their sins away, that lifted a burden from their soul when God made himself real to them, he manifested himself to their heart? Can you allow that what's going on in here today is genuine and that it's real? This is what you read about in the book of Luke chapter number 24. Something real, something genuine, something that matters. Look over here in chapter number 24 and verse number 19. He walks along with them and he kind of just as a friend begins to walk with them. They don't really understand what's going on. They'll be courteous and allow this man to walk. But he says something to them. And here's what he says. He said unto them in verse, number, in verse number 27, verse 17, What manner of communications are these that you have one to another as you walk and are sad? And the one of them said, whose name was Cleopas, answering said to him, Are you kidding me? That's the way they'd say it today. Art thou a stranger in Jerusalem? I mean, don't you know what uproar has been going on here in the last few days? I mean, good night, man. Have you been in a cave? Don't you realize that this town is full of people and that the Roman soldiers are on alert and that we've just had a crucifixion take place? He says to him in verse 17, what manner of communications are these? And Cleopas answers and says, art thou a stranger? Hast thou not known these things which are come to pass there in these days? Then in verse number 19, look how the Lord deals with him. And this is the way he'll deal with you. He said unto them, what things? Are you kidding me? You don't believe the Lord Jesus Christ for a minute didn't know what had happened. He's the one who died. He knew every detail of everything that had ever happened in the last three and a half years of his ministry. He knew all of it. He knew every bit of it. And yet he said to them, what things? You see, that's a question. Not that he wanted to know the answer. No, 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 no. He already knows the answer. When God begins to talk to you, he knows the answer, friend. He wants you to come face to face with the answer. He wants to spark something inside you that causes you to begin to think. What if you walked out of this house today and you may be 17 years old and you get killed in a car wreck down here on Broadway? It could happen. What if they give you a, a, a doctor says to you in a week or two from now, I'm sorry, you've got cancer and it's running through your body and you've only got 30 days, 60 days to live. Your world is going to come to an end. Everything that you thought meant something won't mean a thing to you anymore because you're going to be facing a bleak eternity if you don't know the Lord. You see, he's got a question for you. What things, what things to make you think, to make you stop 
long enough from this high-tech world where you keep yourself in, constantly involved and your mind is dealing with this tech thing, you're going to this thing, you're doing this, this, that, this, that. People today try to cram, to try to cram, to try to cram uh, 30 years of life into 10 days. They want to live fast. They're on, they're on a fast track. Don't know where they're going. Don't know where they're going to get when they get there. And the Lord says, what things? Now look carefully at what happens. The Bible said they said concerning Jesus of Nazareth, verse 19, which was a prophet mighty indeed in word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and the rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all of this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished which were early at the sepulcher. And when they found not his body, they came saying that they'd seen a vision of angels which said that he was alive. You notice how it's always they? And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher and found it even as the women had said, but him they saw not. What kind of testimony is that? What things he said to them? Well, you don't even know what happened. You don't even know who I am. You're a disciple, and yet you have such limited knowledge of what went on. Here you say that you heard a testimony of a woman, but they might have been out of their mind. And we thought he was a prophet that would redeem Israel. Friend, he's a whole lot more than a prophet. To the two on the road to Emmaus, the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm sure marveled at how little they knew about who he was and about what had transpired in the days preceding that. And he lets them have it in the next verse. He lets them know without a question that what they were talking about was a very limited, fundamental, childlike understanding and knowledge of who he was. Look at verse number 25. Then he said to them, O oh, fools, did you get this? Oh, you fools. Can you understand how personal that was? You two fools. He looked at him and said, you're a couple of fools. And slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. Do you understand what he's saying? He's rebuking them as strongly as he can rebuke them. He's cutting them to the very soul with words that are designed to reach right into their heart. He said, you don't have a clue what you're talking about. And then he opens up the scripture to them. And when he opened up the scripture to them, they, my friend, weren't ready for what they were about to hear. Here's a man who had done for, uh, lived a perfect, sinless life, had had gone to the cross and died on that tree for their sins, yet they didn't have a clue what was really going on. They didn't understand any of it. They didn't know he was the Son of God, or that would have been the first thing that came out of their mouth. Oh, he was the Christ. He was the Son of the living God. But no, he's just a prophet. Sure, he's a prophet. He's everything that a prophet ever would be. He's the prophet that Moses said should rise up after me. Like unto me, surely he's a prophet. But yea, he's far more than a prophet. He's the Son of the living God. Amen. He's the God man. And when he went to the cross, it was more than just to redeem Israel. He went to the cross to die for the sins of all mankind. To die for your sins and my sins. He paid the sin debt. He, my friend, was the propitiation, the atonement, the reconciliation. He was God in Christ reconciling the world to himself. All of these things he was. And then he said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it back up. They should have been saying, we're looking for him to come. We're watching for his appearing. We know that in three days he will rise from the dead. But instead of saying that, they said, well, we've heard rumors of how women said they'd seen a vision or had a vision of somebody that was resurrected. But we're not sure exactly what What's going on? Oh, fools and slow of heart. Then he opens up the Bible. Will you let him open the Bible to you? Will you let him show you something in the Bible that will put this book in perspective? So many people say, preacher, I just wish I could understand the Bible. I just wish I could understand it. But there's just so many things about the scripture that just doesn't make sense to me. Let me say this, friend. Do you understand God? I don't understand him. There's so much about God Almighty that I'll never understand. In a million years from now, I'll never be able to take it in. But I'll tell you this right now, this is His Word. It's not the Word of a man. It's not written like a comic book. 
It's not a book that has Theology 101, Theology 102, Theology 103. It's a book that took nearly 2,000 years to write with four, over 40 different authors on three continents. A book, my friend, that is God's revelation to mankind. It is a book that will captivate your soul for eternity. It is God Almighty's eternal living word. And here's what he said. He said to them this. He said in verse 26, Ought not Christ, first of all, to have suffered and then to enter into his glory. He broke down his ministry into two basic points. And these are the two points that the Jew to this day cannot get right. What's that? The sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Even today, Jews teach that there are, many Jews teach that there are two Messiahs, a suffering Messiah and a reigning Messiah. And the reason they do that is because of all the scriptures that are so plain about a suffering Messiah and a reigning Messiah. Folks, it's under, if you understand it the way he laid it out for them, then you can understand it clearly. He came the first time to suffer, but he's coming the second time in glory and power to reign. That begins to open up the Bible, for it sets the Bible in a dispensational view, an aspect where you can understand it didn't all happen at one time. It wasn't all fulfilled at one time. There's much, much more that must be fulfilled. I go away and prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And whether I go, you know, and and the way you know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? I am the way. I am the truth, and I am the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ is the glory. When we leave this world, it's the glory. He reigns in glory. There is nothing but glory in the future for the Son of God, for the saints of the Lord. It's glory. First the suffering, and then the glory. Now what how he opens up the rest of it to them once he made them understand that in verse number 31 their eyes were opened and they knew him when he opened the scripture then he opened their eyes and then they said in verse number 32 did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures don't ever let anybody destroy your faith in that blessed book that book is God Almighty's Word. This book tells me that I have a home in heaven. And this book tells me what happened to me when I got right with God. This book tells me the Holy Spirit entered into me. And that is the down payment, the, the assurance, the guarantee of my future home in heaven. And then when he opened the scriptures, in verse number 36, he appeared to the eleven as they said at meet. And I want you to understand that what happens in verses 36 through 43 is so important. Because he did not appear as a spirit. Because he didn't rise as a spirit. He appeared in physical form. Physically he arose from the dead. In verse 36 of Luke 24, And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst, saith unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted, and supposed that they'd seen a spirit. Just a manifestation in the book of Mark, it says that when he appeared to Cleopas and the disciple, that he appeared in another form. What form is that? Well, I can't explain to you what the form of a spiritual body is like, but I know it's real. But look how it says it. And he said unto them, Why are you troubled? Why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see. For a spirit, in other words, an apparition, a ghost, hath not flesh and bones as you see me have when he thus spoken he showed them his hands and his feet and while they yet believed not for joy and wondered he said to them have you here any meat they gave him a piece of broiled fish and a honeycomb he took it and did eat thereof before them proving to them that he had physically arisen from the dead then in verse number 44 he said to them all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Is there anybody in this house this morning that would deny that Christ was here 2,000 years ago? No. Even the skeptics today have stopped and shut up 
because there is so much overwhelming evidence that he was here 2,000 years ago, both in the Holy Scripture and even in secular historians like Pliny, Suetonius, and uh, Josephus and men like that. There's ample evidence he was here. If he came the first time, he's coming the second time. In verse number 48, he said, You're witnesses of these things. He said, Behold, I send the promise of my Father unto you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem. Watch this now, until you be endued with power from on high. Did you know the early church had people raised from the dead? The early church had people healed instantaneously. Peter said, Silver and gold have I none. Such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. He walked into the room where a dead body was laying. He said, I say unto thee, Tabitha, her name was Tabitha, arise. And she was dead and she came forth. The scripture says even at the passing of the shadow of Peter, they laid the sick in his shadow and they were healed. That's our heritage. There is power in this word. There is power to save you. If you've tried everything you can try, try Jesus. You've been to every self-help program, every half house, every kind of a detox. You've tried everything, listened to all the gurus, bought all their books, and it hadn't done you a bit of good. Jesus can make you free. There is power in the blood. There is power to heal. If the doctor's given you a death sentence, he's doing the best he can. Thank God for the good doctors. But his word is not the last word. Your home is broken. You try to call the counselors in, get ready to pay out big bucks. Call Christ in. And he won't charge you a dime. And he can put a mother and a father, a husband and a wife back together again. He can heal your home. He can heal your marriage. Get that wife or that husband by the hand and bring them to church. Open your heart to the word of God. And God can change your life. There is power. You shall receive power. The thing missing in the church today. We got plenty of entertainment. We got plenty of stained glass windows and big buildings an organization, but there is no power. The apostle said to the church at Corinth, I came to you in the demonstration of the Spirit and power. There's power. Power. Wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. I would, I would say to you from my heart this morning, if there's any way I can, what does all this resurrection represent? What does it mean? It means that there is a living Savior. He's alive. He lives at the right hand of God. And He has sent the Holy Ghost. And when He sent the Holy Ghost, He sent Him in power. Because He said, Ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. That is in Acts 2. And that power is here for us today. Are you fearful? Ask Him for courage. Are you lost? Ask Him to save you. Are you sick? Ask Him to heal you. Are you broken hearted? Ask Him to bind you up. Ask Him. Ask and you shall receive. Are you a doubter? An unbeliever? Ask Him for faith. And faith will come. Faith cometh by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. Bless the name of Jesus. Bless his holy name. Bless him and exalt him. Lift him up. That name above every name. At the name of Jesus. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. That he's Lord to the glory of God the Father. I never was worth a dime. Never will be worth a dime. Outside of him. All that I am, I am. By the grace of God. 
When I hear the Apostle Paul, as he did in Philippians, talking about being injurious and a persecutor and all these things, I say, Paul, that's exactly what I was. But Paul said, I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And that's what I did. I was ignorant and I was in unbelief. But the day I believed, thank God, he lifted that burden for my soul and he changed my nature. And he made me a child of God at that very moment. And he'll do the same for you. He's no respecter of persons. If you miss that, Easter's meaningless. Father, in Jesus' name, use what I've said for the glory of God. And we'll bless you and praise you and glorify you and exalt you and lift you up. In thy sweet holy name we pray. Amen. Let's stand up this morning, brothers. What have we got? Page 392 in your all American Won't you come? Bless your name, Jesus. Bless your sweet name. What a wonderful day to be saved. Yes. Yes. Easter Bless Sunday morning. Name, what a Jesus. day to be saved. Any day is a good day to be saved. Bless your holy name. Bless your holy name. Any day. Won't you come? Yes, sir. Won't you come? There's a fountain filled with me. Drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunge beneath that flood. They lose all their guilty stains. They lose all of them. Lose all of them. They lose all of them. Rejoice. Rejoice to see that fountain in his face. And there may I, go vile as he, go vile as he, wash all my sins away. Wash them all, folks. Wash all my sins away. Hallelujah to God. Hallelujah to God. Hallelujah. Wash them away. be here isn't it it's been good to be here I've enjoyed this like you wouldn't believe hallelujah to God I don't know what I'd do if I didn't have a church that's why he said fail not the assembling of yourselves together when we gather together he gathers together that's what it's about that's why we do this <laughs> when you're out there out there you're the body of Christ. Out there, the body of Christ. When you come in here, you're the church of God because he comes and meets with that body. And there is the foundation of God, the habitation of God through the Spirit. He comes and meets with us. Thank the Lord. Appreciate you listening to me.